I want to thank everyone for coming to this Friday 10 o'clock session. Bonnie Penix, who was really our leader, uh, is not with us today. I'm Mary Ellen Burns, the tech host. Our speaker today is Angie um, Rooney, who's going to be talking, and I hope I pronounce it right, Silperstein, the largest memorial in the world. Angie has been a member of Renaissance for quite some time and has given some very interesting um, uh, talks. Um, and I'm gonna let her introduce the, the rest of herself. I'm gonna ask Angie some questions that will be more about her later. So Angie, I'm throwing it over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to my slides. And hopefully everything will work. Um, just a moment, of course. Uh, excuse me, I'm having a problem. And I don't know why, but I will. So just to share screen. Mm -hmm. Just a second, I have to get my slides up. Okay, I'm um, going to back to you. And I'm going to share screen and here we go. All right, bear with me while we get this set up. It's a little bit complicated. Doesn't mean to be, but uh, it's technology. Okay, let me get that out of the way. Can everybody see my slide? Mary Ellen? Yes. Okay, let's get started then. Stolperstein is a project in Europe. It's the largest decentralized project. Uh, I need to get these people out of my way. Uh, just a second, I don't know why I have all these people in the way. Uh, it's the largest decentralized memorial in the world. Stolperstein means stumbling stones in German. And people stumble upon these stones and take account of what happened in that location. You may hear me saying Stolpersteine, which is the plural, or Stolperstein, which is the singular. They shall not be forgotten. This presentation is dedicated to the memory of my grandfather, Max Michels, and my aunt, Magda Kreisaber, both of whom perished in the Holocaust. As I said, they are not forgotten. Before we really talk about Stolperstein Initiative and all of that, um, we need to talk a little bit about the history of Germany after the First World War. The First World War ended on November 11th, 1918 with uh, the defeat of Germany and its allies. There were uh, all kinds of things going on in Germany at that time. People were demoralized, they were unhappy, they were poor, and uh, there was a major depression and hyperinflation. People wanted to feel better about themselves and they also needed somebody to blame for their misery. In 1933, the Jewish population of Germany numbered about 525,000. This was less than 1% of the total German population of 79 million at the time, but it was the Jews of Germany that were blamed for everything that was bad going on in, Europe, in Germany. In January, 1933, Adolf Hitler uh, was elected chancellor of Germany. The Nazis made it their policy to make Germany Juden Rhein, Jew free. In September 1935, they passed what are referred to as the Nuremberg Laws, which, divest, uh, which um, divested German Jews of their citizenship and their property. The world looked on and wrung its hands and did nothing. Finally, the pressure on the Jews in Germany was so extreme that the world could not ignore it. So President Franklin Roosevelt called a conference which was held in Avion, uh, France, avion le bain France, referred to in history as the Avion Conference. 32 nations met to discuss the plight of the Jews, but they were unwilling to increase quotas or accept more Jews in most of those countries. In 1938, an event called happened that is referred to in history as Kristallnacht, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about that in a little bit. It's the night of the broken glass. Uh, in March, 1939, Germany invaded Czechoslovakia and annexed Austria, called the Anschluss. And in September, 1939, Germany invaded Poland and World War II began in Europe. In June, 1941, the final solution began to be implemented in. Uh, by the uh, Nazis. 
So we have people being pressured very, very strongly. So, sorry, I'm having trouble with the slide. As I said, Hitler was uh, elected chancellor of Germany in 1933. Pressure on the Jews where people were um, humiliated. There were boycotts. The top picture on the left shows a, a mixed uh, couple that are being humiliated because they, uh, the woman and the man, one, the man is Jewish and the woman is not. Uh, there were boycotts, there were um, graffiti. People were forced to wear the Star of David to identify themselves as Jewish. Kristallnacht. This is a very famous event in uh, European history, particularly in Germany. Uh, Hitler wanted to pressure the Jews to leave Germany. And first this was covertly done. And that, then he was looking for an excuse to make, to really put pressure on the Jews, to force them out. He got that, uh, what he wanted as far as pressure on the Jews because a Nazi uh, envoy was assassinated in Paris by a Jewish student in November of 1938. That night, all hell broke loose in Germany, so to speak. Synagogues were torched, uh, businesses were vandalized, schools were burned, men were arrested and thrown in concentration camps. Um, the men in concentration camps were told that if they could find some country that would give them a visa or a passport to get out of Germany, they, could, they would be uh, let out of the concentration camps. So their families and their friends frantically looked for some nation that would actually take them. This picture on the far right on the bottom shows people lined up in front of an embassy in Vienna trying to get some kind of an exit document for their men in the concentration camps. I'm going to tell, um, this is a very personal story. So I'm going to tell you this whole thing from a personal, from my family's point of view. Kristallnacht found my family, my mother's family in Berlin. They were they living in Berlin in uh, the area called the uh, Hansa Fertel, or right by the River Spree, right by the uh, zoo. Those of you who've been to Berlin know kind of where that is, it's West Berlin. And my grandmother had a couture house. She designed and made beautiful dresses for famous people like Marlene Dietrich and so forth. My family though were not German citizens. They were Yugoslav citizens through my grandfather. And uh, Kristallnacht was kind of an open secret. So the Yugoslav embassy sent a guard to stand in front of my grandmother's store. So it was not looted. But the family was called into the embassy shortly after and told we can't protect you anymore. You need to go home, back to Yugoslavia. My mother and her siblings, my grandmother, they decided that the best thing they could do was to be a lot, to separate, to go different way, places, so they could possibly be a lifeline for each other. Uh, my aunt Clary, who's in the top left, was able to put the plan in place first. She received a visa from a former employer to go to London. She spent the war years in London during the Blitz. My uncle Geza took his grandmother, his mother and his youngest sister, Magda, back to Yugoslavia and eventually to Budapest. And my mother who was engaged at the time went to Shanghai, which was one of the last places you could go without a passport or, or any kind of papers. My father was from Munich, Germany, and his parents obtained false papers for him to leave Germany and also to go to Shanghai. Again, that place you did not have to have a passport to get into. And my father was a very brave man. He wasn't afraid of much, but uh, he, he always kind of was fearful of flying. I asked my mother about this one time and she said, when he got on the plane from Munich to Trieste, he flew to, to Trieste and then by train to Genoa to catch a ship, uh, the Gestapo came on the, the plane one more time after being on three or four times to check papers. And my father was only 20 years old, um, barely 20, and was going to the ends of the earth by himself. He had nerves of steel and he did not give himself away, but he never liked flying thereafter. So those people that had the, the wherewithal, the prescience to leave, uh, left 
for any country that would take them. But it was a very small number. Only about approximately 280,000 European Jews found refuge prior to World War II. That was less than 3% of the pre-war European Jewish population of 9.5 million. Six million died. Those that stayed behind were mostly arrested, transported, and faced death in the camps or elsewhere. As I said, six million people died. So let's talk about Stolperstein. So what is the Stolperstein? It's the world's largest decentralized memorial project. As I said, in English, it's stumbling stones. They're small brass plated memorial stones embedded directly underfoot in the cobblestones of the street to commemorate the victims of Nazi, of the Holocaust at their last known residence before rest and transport, their last known free residence. Uh, it memorializes not only Jews, but all victims of the Nazi regime, including uh, Sentai, Roma, disabled dissidents, Jews, of course, and Afro-Germans and any asocial citizens, any of the victims of the Nazi persecution. So it's not just for Jews. It's an art, it was originally an art project. In 1992, uh, an, a German artist in Cologne, his name is uh, Gunter Demnig, uh, this was doing an art project, an art exhibit, and he decided that he wanted to create a monument to the victims of the Nazi regime. He felt that memorializing six million dead was an impossible and futile task. Instead, he aimed to commemorate individuals at exactly the last place where they had freely lived before the person became a victim of the Nazis. And to recognize, and this is the important part, to recognize each identifiable victim as an individual, as a real person who had lived, loved, suffered, and died, not just as a number. He quotes the Talmud and says, a person is only forgotten when his or her name is forgotten. My aunt said to me one time, we live as long as somebody remembers us. So he designed what are called the Stolpersteine, as I said, stumbling stones. They consist of a concrete cube about um, 3.9 inches in square, about four inches square, bearing a brass plaque inscribed with names and dates of victims of the Nazi extermination or persecution. And they're installed, as I said, in the pavement in front of the last address of choice of the victims. The inscription on each stone begins, here lived, followed by the victim's name, date of birth and fate, internment, suicide, exile, or in the vast majority of cases, deportation and murder. He's now laid over 80,000 of these stones, personally overseeing the wording and installation of each one. Uh, the task keeps him on the road for 300 days a year. It's quite amazing. The Stolperstein focuses on the individual tragedies. Every person had a special life and every Stolperstein represents a unique story. Where will you find them? You'll find them all over Europe, installed on the sidewalks of quiet streets and busy thoroughfares, in Berlin, in Prague, in Amsterdam, in Budapest, in Paris, in Rome, and in large cities and small towns throughout the continent, wherever Jews or other dissidents lived, once lived. We've personally seen them in Berlin, in Frankfurt, in Darmstadt, in Munich, in Paris, Salzburg, and Vienna. As I said, there are 80,000 of them now installed in more than 1,600 cities, towns, and villages in 26 countries. In 2017, the first Stolperstein was uh, installed outside of Europe in Buenos Aires to uh, honor hundreds of German Jewish children who found refuge in Argentina in exile. Where will you see them? Right on underneath your feet. As today's generations walk these streets, they stumble across them. That's why it's called Stolpersteine or stumbling block stones. The Stolperstein's presence makes the viewer take notice of what took place upon this very spot and not in the not too distant past. They become aware of the real person who once lived at this address. How are they installed? Here we see Deming installing them. Deming is now, as I said, laid 80,000. Uh, personally overseeing the wording and installation of each one. 
the project's motto is one victim, one stone. Referencing it again, the teaching in the Talmud, the book of the Jewish law that a person is only forgotten when his or her name is forgotten. Demning now has a partner, his name is Michael Friedrich Friedlander, uh, who is a sculptor, but he has taken on the task of making each of the, the uh, Stolpersteine and uh, doing the, ins the inscriptions on the brass plates because uh, Demi could no longer do everything. And he's, Friedrich Friedlander started this in 2005 to help uh, Demi. So how did I learn about Stolpersteine? My Stolpersteine story. My husband and I were in Berlin in 2009, the first time I ever saw Stolperstein. I said to myself or to my husband, I wanted, it would be nice if I had one for my grandfather who died in the Holocaust. Uh, so I'm going to tell you this, the rest of this presentation about one particular individual and that particular individual and his story, as I said, it's one stone, one name, is my grandfather. His name is Max Michels. He was born in 1880 and he died in Auschwitz in 1944. As I said, each Stolperstein represents a unique story, and this is the story of my grandfather. Well, I got interested in uh, getting a Stolperstein laid for him. So I started Googling, uh, as we all do, in around 2009, and I found a very interesting thing because my, gran my grandfather had lived in Munich, and I found that Munich was the only major city that does not permit the installation of Stolpersteine on public property. And come to find out that was because of political controversy between uh, uh, some members of the Jewish community and the uh, Munich government. Basically, someone felt that, it, do, that uh, it was disrespectful to walk on such a memorial and so they should not be installed. I let the project go for a few years. But in 2016, I revisited the idea of a Stolperstein for my grandfather. I found that the Stolperstein is mainly a grassroots initiative. The project is a grassroots initiative. Local groups, often res residents of a particular street or school children working on a project come together to research the, bi the biographies of local victims and to raise the cost to install each stone because there is a cost involved. I found, uh, finally found a website for the Munich Stolpersteine Initiative. It's an organization whose purpose it is to recognize the Jews of Munich with a Stolperstein for each person lost in the Holocaust. I found that the uh, group is headed by a charismatic American journalist named Terry Schwartzberg, who has moved permanently to Munich to increase the Jewish presence in the city. He and his team, a group of German people who have made it their uh, passion to, for this endeavor to, set, uh, to um, install Stolperstein in Munich. We emailed, we emailed a lot. And uh, after uh, all these emails, they, they said they had finally worked out a workaround um, to the political controversy. Stolpersteiner are still not permitted to this day on public property in Munich, but they are permitted on private property with the owner's consent. Uh, but they uh, get, warned me that finding the owner of a particular building is uh, not easy and then getting the permission can also be really very difficult at times. People don't always want to get permission for this. But they did send me uh, biographical information on my grandfather that they found in the Munich archives, the State Archives of Munich, which has a, a biography a memorial book of the Munich Jews, of Munich Jews. Um, that this um, biography told about my grandfather's occupation, where he was born, his children, and some addresses. But they asked me specifically if I'd known his last known address in Munich. They, I mean, they had a, some addresses there on the archive biography, but uh, these were all addresses where he was waiting his fate, and where he'd been forced to move into areas that where Jews were in, in Munich. 
And I replied that while I had addresses for him until his, he was transported, I absolutely did not want the memorial placed in one of his last addresses. If a Stolperstein was to be placed from anywhere in Munich, I would want it placed in front of the house where my grandparents had lived and where my father had grown up and where my grandfather had once been happy. I did not want it placed anywhere where he had been terrorized and miserable while awaiting an unknown fate. They said they'd try to find out. But let me tell you a little bit about my grandfather first. Um, he was quite a dandy in his youth. You can see the band handlebar mustache. He was a big man. He was six foot two in his stocking feet. My father was six one. In all but the, the latest, the last photos of him, he has a twinkle in his eye and a grin. You can see him here in the center in uh, World War I with his fellow officers. And he's the one with the grin on his face. He came back from the First World War uh, a hero. He was very severely wounded at, I believe, the Battle of Verdun. He was awarded uh, two Iron Crosses, and, and, uh, which were the honorable ones from the First World War, plus other medals and commendations. I have these. And uh, he came back to his beloved Munich. He loved Munich very, very much. He had a family. This is a very sweet picture of my grandparents and my father. My father's maybe three or four at that time and the chauffeur and the big touring car. He had a business. Uh, my grandparents owned an art gallery called the Stufler Gallery. It was in the Park Hotel on a very fashionable uh, street in Munich, an area in Munich, Maximilianplatz. This is a picture of that. I actually found this postcard online very recently. And uh, the gallery would be right where the arrow points. The inside of the gallery in the 1950s looked like these pictures. This is the one time I was there. That's what it looked like. My husband and I had tried to find the, he lived a full life. My husband and I had tried to find the address when we were in Munich. We had an address, but we couldn't, we were on the right street, but we couldn't figure out which building and many of the buildings had been bombed. Uh, what we didn't know is that the house numbers in Munich had been changed after the war. So we were looking for the wrong building, but it's the house still exists. The houses on either side of it are new but the, this building does exist. It sits on a lovely, elegant little street just across from the Englischer Garten, which is in the English Garden in, uh, in Munich, which is the largest urban park in Europe. It's the central park of Munich. Very, very pretty park, very large. In the Schwabing district of Munich, Schwabing, the Schwabing district was the arts district of Munich. This, house, this is the house my father grew up in, a house that he was always a bit homesick for, despite all that had happened in the intervening years. I've pointed here on pictures of the, the penthouse at the top as a post-war addition. My grandparents li lived on the top floor of the original house. Uh, they had the whole top floor there. After months of uncertainty, uh, we didn't know whether the project would go forward or not, a project to install a Stolperstein for my grandfather, it accelerated. The current owner of the house was identified and contacted. Surprisingly, he was very positive about the idea and he gave his permission and blessing. He, he had inherited the house from his grandmother and who had inherited it in turn from her father. He'd been very interested in the history of the house and hadn't been able to find much about it. Once he was identified and the, the uh, Stolperstein Initiative gave me his name, he, uh, he asked me to email him. So I sent him a long email with some pictures and he, re he replied and uh, a very, very nice email. He expressed his condolences and historical remorse for what had happened, though it was clear he was born long after the events had taken place. He's one of the new generation of Germans that own their history, but are with a new worldview moving beyond it. There, as I mentioned previously, there are costs associated with the installation. I asked the initiative how they wished me to pay. You know, what do I owe you? How do I pay? Do you want a wire transfer? 
what, what should I do? They replied that I owed nothing. There had been an anonymous donor who covered all costs for all six of the Stolperstein that were to be installed in front of the building. There had actually been six Jewish people that lived in that uh, house. Uh, my grandfather was one of them. Uh, there were two other families. Not too long later, the initiative revealed that the anonymous benefactor was none other than the owner, current owner of the house. He's truly an admirable individual in Jewish parlance. He's a real mensch. November 12, 2018 was the date set for the installation and a ceremony. We were invited to the ceremony, so November found us in Munich. I'd been able to contact an old friend there who had once lived with my parents in California. She was very excited and she said that she very much wanted to join us for, uh, to honor my father, come to the ceremony. I also mentioned the event to my cousin who lives in London, who is my grandfather's great niece. Our grandfathers were brothers. She too said she wanted to attend and she came from England with her two grown sons and her adult granddaughter. I'd originally thought that only I and my husband would be in at the ceremony along with the, the Stolperstein Initiative people. It had ended up there were seven of us, us there who were related or attached to my family by affection. Unbelievable. To our, our surprise, uh, the, oh, the night before the ceremony, let me just back up a tiny bit, the um, Stolperstein Initiative headed by, as I said, Terry Schwartzberg had a dinner party for us and we met the owner of the house at that point. His name was Stefan Schmidt, and they were very nice people. So the next day we walked from our hotel to the ceremony and to our surprise, almost 50 people were at the ceremony in front of the house, the initiative members, the owner of the house, as well as members of the public and the press. Uh, introductions were made by Terry Schwartzberg he, uh, in the picture here. He is holding a picture of my grandfather. Uh, the owner of the house, who I'll show you in the next picture, uh, spoke about the history of the house as far as he knew it, and a young woman cantor sang two prayers. And I gave a speech about my grandfather. I was later told that, when I, that I was one of the very few relatives that had been in attendance at such an installation in Munich so far. Actually, the initiative told uh, us that uh, they really started working on getting Stolpersteine installed after I had contacted them and they were able to uh, come up with the workaround to the political controversy in Munich. Uh, on the left, you see um, Terry Schwartzberg and uh, speaking, at, there is Stefan Feinschmidt, the owner of the house, and there's a workman uh, doing the installation. Here I am making my speech. As I gave my speech, this is the end of the speech that I gave. I thought I would share this with you. My grandfather was a good man. According to my cousins, he was everyone's favorite uncle, warm and generous. He could roar with laughter and he had a magnificent temper. It was all bark and no bite. I never met my grandfather, but I know him. I know that he loved a good cigar. I have a cigar cutter. I know that his favorite wine was a white sparkling Italian called Fiscati. I know he loved to fish in the Isar River. Isar runs through Munich. I know he would have loved me. My father told me so. As I said, my grandfather was a good man. He did not deserve to die in the way he did. He should have died of old age in his own bed, probably in this house. But in that case, ironically, I would not be speaking here today. I believe my grandfather's spirit and soul rests now in front of the house where he lived in the happy years. All of this was made possible by the wonderful members of the Stol Munich Stolperstein Initiative and by the amazing generosity of spirit and goodwill of the current owner of the house at 8 Seestrasse Schwabing, Munich. My grandfather is now memorialized by a Stolperstein right at the house's entrance, along with the six other Jewish people who had lived there and died in the Holocaust. Stefan has uh, emailed me that he always says hello to my grandfather when he goes into the house. And members of the initiative have emailed me and said that, keep the brass, that, that they keep the brass plates clean and shined. 
here's the actual uh, Stolperstein from my grandfather. And it says, here lived Max Michels, born 1880, deported to Theresienstadt, which was concentration camp in 1942, murdered on the 18th of October, 1944 in Auschwitz. I hope that my grandfather at last sleeps in peace. There's postscript. While all of this was going on, a craftsman wearing a blue shirt and a large hat and his helper prepared the site and installed the Stolperstein. I was very disappointed not to have met Gunter Demnick, the artist who had designed this memorial, since I'd been told the date had been chosen specifically to accommodate his schedule. Actually, they installed Stolperstein in Munich that day in 12 different locations. We were number 10 on the list. Our uh, ceremony started at two o'clock in the afternoon. So they were very, very busy. So uh, as I said, we, the date was chosen to accommodate his schedule. Only later did we learn that the craftsman, the, guy, the man in the blue shirt with the big hat, installing the stones and plaques was Gunter himself. I was unable to thank him as he disappeared immediately after completing the installations. This very shy, self-effacing gentleman. Will there be Stolperstein in one day in the US to memorialize victims of hate crimes such as lynchings? Funny you should ask. Inspired by the Stolperstein project in Germany and with their blessing, a group in the US unaffiliated with the German program, it has nothing to do with the Stolperstein program in Europe, um, a teacher and a German scholar and an activist came together in 2017 in Guilford, Connecticut uh, to develop a way to reuse research unearthed to tell the truth of Northern slavery and to change the local historical narrative by creating their own stones projects. This project is called Witness Stones Project. It's in Guilford, Connecticut. And as I said, it's inspired by the Stolperstein project. It has nothing to, it's not affiliated with it. But here we have their um, stone. It's to Pompey, a carpenter enslaved here circa 1775. Last known slave in Guilford, died in 1819. Very interesting. If you're interested in this, I uh, can share further information and resources with you. If, uh, for example, there's an article on the Wik uh, there's a Wikipedia article that talks about Stolperstein in great detail. If you want information on how to order a Stolperstein, you can go to this website, www.stolpersteine.eu, which is Gunter Deming's website. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a cost for Stolperstein. Currently, it's 132 euros or about $160 plus other incidental costs. Lead time is several months, depending on Gunter Demnick's schedule. Post pandemic, it may be longer. Relatives and descendants are always welcome at the installation. And if you want further information, you can contact me and I will try to help you navigate the process. I have this uh, resource list as a Word document. So if anybody wants that, I can email that to you. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. Angie, thank you so much. I don't know how you could maintain your composure because I'm teary. <laughs> uh, are there any questions that you want to pose in the chat? I have a, a, a couple of them that I can ask uh, while people are, are uh, waiting. Uh, one of the things that I was um, wondering, Angie, the stones exist, but they just have the deportation date and the, uh, the murder date. Um, are there stories that have been collected and are they in any kind of a central place or archive that people can access? Not that I'm aware of, not that I'm aware of. I think it's by each town, each city. Does that for being yeah. able to, uh, to do, um, because you tell such an incredible story about your family members. And I'm a member of the Jewish Genealogical Society. We had a talk this weekend. I was shocked by how many people, uh, lost people in the Holocaust. Um, I, I appear to be lucky of you know no close family members or it seems to be that um are there other sites where there are stories where people can 
can go to find out a little bit more detail on the victim. So it's not just a memorial stone, but more. Well, there's the uh, uh, this Jewish Gen website. Right. Right. And the Holocaust Museums, the yeah. U.S. Holocaust Museum is online. Uh, Yad Vashem, of course, is also mm -hmm. online. That's probably the best source uh, because people right after the Holocaust they, uh, sent documents in. I remember in the 90s, I, I, I sent, I think, 13 or 14 pages of Holocaust victims from my family. And most of this is online these days. U.S. Holocaust Museum, right. Hashem. Uh, I think there's a Los Angeles Holocaust Museum. You know, and remember, it's not just Jews; it was other right. people as well. And uh, the the other uh, thing is, is that I noticed that on your list of, you know, the slide that you have, is it possible to? Um, I should have copied it to get a copy of that slide so that we can actually send that. To I have that in a word form for you. If it's in word form, so then when we go to send the link to everybody who signed up, I would like to include that. And I'm going to include um, the address. There is a list of where all the stones are. There is a website that lists them all. And I'll include that on your list. I don't think Great. it's included on yours. Uh, I have a couple of more uh, uh, questions and some comments, but I'm going to open it up to other people. You can either raise your hand at this point. Um, Dolores has her hand raised, Mary Ellen. Thank you. So Dolores. Okay. Um, I'm on the other end of um, my uh, whole family is German. And so um, I, I'm shaking all over. That was so yeah. powerful. Yeah, really but you did mention that there were many others who suffered as well as Jewish. Mm -hmm. And in my father's town, for instance, his brother, who had no legs from the First World War, was taken away. And many others in, in his small town. And he also lived about 40 miles from the border of France. And my father took the children of Jewish people through to France uh, in his town. So I'm um, shaking. Um, I'd like to know something about the plaque so um, that I could do. Um, so I hope you send it out to everybody or at least put my name down. Um, thank and, you. And, and Angie, can you add on to that? That uh, Because I also have uh, a German friends that did a tremendous amount during the war. Um, am I right at Vaj Hashem in Israel where you can honor the people who- Yes, the righteous of all nations. Right, so can you talk a little bit about that? Because that would be wonderful for uh, Dolores to be able to do. I, I don't know a great deal about it. I think you have to get in touch with Yad Vashem yourself. Okay. I mean, there are, uh, there are some very famous people like Schindler, of course, Oscar Schindler. Right. Yes. Sugahara. Sugahara, the Japanese consul. So, and again, Dolores, I do have that information. So if you don't mind, Angie, I'm going to have you do the word and I'm going to add a few places. Sure, that's that perfect. I'll, I'll send you the document that I put together and then you can add. Wonderful. And Kat, looking as well, anybody else that would like to make a comment? Yeah, I would. This is Elaine. Um, hi, Elaine. Hi. Loved your presentation, Angie. I just wanted to share that um, after Angie told me about her Stolpersteine story, I went in and Googled the word Stolpersteine and the name of the town where my aunt, uncle, and their daughter lived and found the entire list of all of the Stolpersteine that had been put into that town. And there, the town had funded the, um, the cost of the Stolpersteine. So my aunt and uncle and my 12 year old cousin were all memorialized. And I also found that they had named a street after my 12 year old cousin. Mm -hmm. And there was a newspaper article and a picture of her that I had never seen before. So um, sometimes the research is much easier than you ever expected. Expected, yeah. And, and most places were not like, uh, really are not like Munich. They didn't have mm -hmm. the political controversy. Most right. places, the, 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 the city itself paid for the installations. Yeah. Or at least in many places. 
Yeah, I did. I told them that they're, my husband's talking to me in the background, said, right. make sure that everybody knows that it's not just in Germany, it's in 26 countries and now in, uh, in uh, Argentina as well. So you, so in, you in, see in Austria, you'll see them in, uh, in all kinds of places. In fact, when we were in Amsterdam, we were staying at an Airbnb and our first day when we walked out, we turned in one direction and we probably took six steps and came across Stolpersteine. Yeah. So do we have any other comments? And, and there are um, uh, other memorials. If people would like that, there are quite a few, Not they're not silver signs, but there's different um, uh, uh, memorials now to those people who've been uh, lynched in the South. I will gladly compile a list of that and send to people. Uh, I hate to say that this is an odd kind of tourism, but uh, it's one of the things that I do. There's a... a, a Jewish memorials also in Boston, a walking path, a fantastic one, both at the Jewish Museum in Vienna. Um, but one of the things that I will try to also send to people is, and I'm gonna ask uh, Angie, there is, this isn't a form of a question if you know others. When I was in Vienna about four years ago, there was in the regular Viennese museum, an artist had taken the city center of Vienna, recreated every house in a model in what would have been the Jewish uh, section and um, uh, marked the houses with the actual stories. No, uh, I haven't seen that. We were in Vienna, I've been to Vienna actually twice. Right. I've been to the memorials in, in Vienna, but right. not into the museum itself. So, and this is an odd question. I, I don't expect you to know the answer, but what I'm noticing is how many memorials are created, including the one in Vienna. The, the basic one is by um, Whitehead. I'm blanking on her first name. Non-Jewish, that a lot of these memorials are. So could do you want to make- Demnick is, is not Jewish at all. The artist that created the Stolperstein uh, project is not Jewish. And there's the memorials going on all kinds of places. Uh, I don't know if Kathy's on. Kathy Keir? I don't know if she's on or not. Yes, I am. I am. Yeah, Kathy. Kathy just sent me an article about Bobby, uh, um, Bobby Yar that they're finally putting up a memorial there in, Ukraine. in the Ukraine. Mm. So, and I know that this is very personal. Um, we have some people, is there anybody who has a story about their own family that you'd like to share? We have 11 chats too. I don't know if you saw those. Oh, and I'm sorry, I, I, I apologize. I thought my chat was open. Mary Ellen, do you uh, wanna stop the recording? Do you think people might feel more comfortable? Yes, that sharing? sounds wonderful. So let's do that. Let me uh, go ahead and thank Angie very, very much for sharing this story. Um, it, uh, and with such, um, well, I'm, I'm just gonna, you know, such compassion um, that I just really got a sense of being there. So thank you so much. Uh, and we're going to um, thank her and, Hope that people will come to more of these. So thanks.